Greetings, Professor Falcon. Shall we play a game? Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. If you've ever looked at old computers like the Altair, the Imsi, or even the venerable old PDP-11, you've no doubt seen their impressive front panels with dozens of switches and cool blinking lights. But what do they all do and how do you use them? How did they use the front panel to actually bootstrap and run a classic computer back in the day? Well, follow along as today we're going to program the computer from War Games, the MSI 8080, completely from scratch using only the front panel switches and LEDs. And I'll show you exactly how it's done. We'll cover all the important steps along the way without any hand waving. I'm going to write a small demo program in assembly language and then compile it to hex and then convert it to binary and then enter it into the front panel and finally execute the code to watch the LEDs display the amazing, for 1975, results. In about 15 minutes, you'll know exactly what the front panel is for and how to enter the code and data needed to bootstrap almost any old computer system. The front panels of a few classic computers are, at least to me, some of the most beautiful and fascinating displays out there. Oh sure, a machine like the Altair might be fairly basic and looks to have been made of the types of switches and components that you could ostensibly pick up at a Radio Shack back in the day. Because the goal for the Altair was, in part, to reduce costs, since it was targeted towards individuals and enthusiasts rather than large companies and universities, but other systems had more time, budget, and style. I think a few are downright beautiful, and we'll take a look at a few of the best. Now you have to keep in mind that back in those days, going back to the mid 70s and before, computers typically did not ship with a ROM operating system of any kind. There was no built in basic, no command shell, no interpreter to fall back on. When you turned it on, it didn't drop into any kind of input prompt, it just sat there, empty, doing absolutely nothing. Even if you wanted to load your program from a roll of paper tape, you'd at least need a short program to do the actual reading of that paper tape. And the only way you could enter that program would be using the front panel switches. You had to start somewhere, and all that you had to start with was memory and the processor. The switches were your only gateway. Each front panel might have a few lights and switches specific to that model, of course, but almost all shared a few basic elements that we're going to be concerned with today. At a minimum, we need the ability to inspect the location and memory, and some way to store our own byte at any particular address of that memory. And then finally, some way to say go to start the computer executing. That basic functionality is usually provided in the form of a set of switches for the address that you wish to inspect or modify. Those switches correspond to the binary bits of the memory address. Once you've entered the address in question, in binary of course, you can press a button to fetch the current value stored at that location and display it on the LEDs that show the contents of the data bus. The value is displayed there in binary again using the LED display. If you wish to store a new value at that address, you set the data switches to the value in question that you want and then press a switch labeled commit or store or write or something similar. Whatever data value you've entered via the switches would then be stored at the address you had previously specified through the address switches. Some of the front panels on the less expensive machines like the Altair and the MSI are overloaded, which is to say that there are 16 switches and they're all used for setting the address and then some of them are reused as just the data switches. Once you set the address and press examine, it puts that address on the bus, after which you use the lower eight switches to set the data value you plan to store there. One that I've always been fascinated with is the PDP-11. Produced at about the same time as the Altair, but as part of a long line of PDPs that came long before it from digital, it clearly inspired what would be found on the personal computers of the day. Because the address space is larger, it contains switches for 22 bits of address space and for 16-bit words. By comparison, the PDP-8, which is of course a fair bit older, features only 12 bits of address space on the front panel. 12 bits doesn't sound like a lot, and since it can only address 4096 different locations, it really isn't. But it helps to know that the registers and memory slots on the PDP-8 were 12 bits instead of 8, so it's not quite as limited as it seems at first glance. The PDP-10 shown here features 18 bits of address space, and very odd bytes featuring 36 bits instead of just 8. But what you're really looking at here is not the computer itself, but the computer that was used to start the computer. You see, a PDP-10 was a full-on mainframe, and to boot it, you could even use a smaller PDP-11 mini-computer to do the job. So the front panel that you're actually interacting with here is a PDP-1140 front end, and so that panel looks about the same as that of a PDP-11. Before we can key anything into the front panel, however, we need a program to actually key in. And it better be short, because I don't feel like toggling in a few kilobytes by hand. Maybe like a couple dozen bytes at most. But what can we actually accomplish in a program that short? 
Since we're really doing this as a proof of concept, I decided a little program to scroll the LED data display like Knight Rider ought to be sufficient, and so that's what we're going to do. But I still need to write the code, and once I have that code, I have to use an 8080 assembler to turn that code into actual program bytes. And then I need to turn those program bytes into raw binary that I can enter via the front panel. Then I'll enter the program and fire it off, and we'll watch it do its work. To get started, let's head over to the desktop and drop into the editor while I'll write the little app to scroll the LEDs. So the first thing we need is going to be an assembly language program that will do the countdown of the LEDs for us. And I'm going to make you just put up with me pasting it in here instead of me typing it live for the effect because, hey, you got stuff to do too. But let's take a look at how this code actually works. Org0 means we're going to start the code at address 0000. Next, we're going to move 1 into A. Now we're going to rotate A right through the carry. And what that does is it moves everything in A down by one bit, and it puts whatever was in bit zero into the carry flag. So that has the effect of setting the carry. Next, we're gonna move A to be 254. Now, this is actually the inverse bit mask of what you see on the display because the bits are backwards from what you would expect. One is off, zero is lit. And so in order to get a single bit lit, we need to have all but one bit set in this mask. So this is just the inverse or the XOR of one. Now, OutFF takes the byte in the accumulator, which right now would be FE, and it's going to send it out to the display of the LEDs on the front panel. Every time you see an OutFF, that's what that's doing. Now, this is doing a load X sine extended of D and E with a value 1. Now, when I say D and E, that's because there's two registers, two 8-bit registers, D and E, that you can treat as a pair of registers, DE, as a 16-bit register. And there are certain instructions, like LXI, which is load extended immediate, that will treat them as a 16-bit register pair. This will load the value 1 into the register, and of course, that's just going to set the lowest bit, and everything else will be set to zeros in both of the registers. Same here, H and L, which are high and low, are being set to zero all the way through. Next, we're doing a double precision add, which is the registers in DE plus the register values in HL put back into HL. Each time we come through here, it's going to add one to the HL pair. If it doesn't overflow, if it doesn't carry, then we're going to go back to delay and we're going to do the add again. So we're just going to loop in this little tight loop here, adding one until the carry overflows, meaning that we've reached FFFF and passed it by one. Now this RLC is actually what shifts the bit pattern on the display. It started out as FE, now we're going to shift it left one. It shifts through itself, so whatever is in bit seven goes back to bit zero. To make any use of assembly language, however, we actually have to assemble the code, and that is convert it into the raw bytes that the computer is going to expect. Now, of course, it's not going to want bytes, it's going to want bits, but we'll get there in the next step. For now, we're going to get to the bytes. And I simply paste my code into an online 8080 assembler with a pretty printer, and look, it pops out all nicely formatted. I'm going to grab this with the bytes and all, so I can paste it into my document here. Now you can see this is my original code, my original comments, and now we have the hexadecimal bytes for move immediate A, which is going to be 3E and the value 0, 01. Rotate accumulator right is 0F. Here we have 3E again because it's move immediate A, but this time the value is FE. Out is D3 and the port is FF. Load extended immediate, and it's going to actually specify the full 16 bits that are being passed into the two register pair. 21 hex is going to be the instruction for loading into the HL pair, 16-bit immediate, and here are the 16-bit values. Now, it's always going to be low-high. So in this case, it was 0, 01 is the first byte. 0, 00 is the high byte. So it looks like 0100. 0, 0. It looks like 100 when you're looking at it just sequentially. But you have to read it backwards because in Intel assembly, the values go from least significant bit to most significant byte. 19 is our hex code for DAD of the DE register pair. You're always going to use HL as the other register pair, by the way, so it just has to specify the D pair here. And so on, JNC delay. 7 is your rotate left, and then we have C3 to 0500, which is going to go back to this instruction, which is our loop label. Don't worry if that doesn't make a great deal of sense. What you need to know is that for these instructions, there are numeric values that the compiler or assembler actually is going to assign to those. But our front panel doesn't have a hex input. It has a binary input. So what to do? I'm going to grab this column of hex digits. 
I'm going to go to a web page that has a handy converter where I can paste in hex digits. I'll say pad the leading zeros and I'll say I want a binary conversion. Here we go. This is 345tool.com, by the way. There are my binary digits. I should probably number them just so I know what I'm doing later. Let me do that now. There, and to confirm that we have the right number of binary bits, you can see I start at 12, 13, 14, and here I go 12, 13, 14, ending with a zero. So these become the actual bits for the instructions for my program that I'm going to need to enter into the front panel. So we started with a little algorithm here, written in assembly language. We converted that to hexadecimal, and then we converted the hexadecimal to binary. Now that we have a binary sequence that we can enter into the front panel, it's time to learn how to use those switches and LEDs. And remember, there are three important operations that we'll be performing. First, we'll use the 16 switches to set the address that we care about into the address bus. Our program will start at address zero in our case. When we press examine, that address is placed onto the address bus and the current value of that location will be shown on the display. For each of the program bytes, we will set the lower eight switches to the value that we want to store at that location and then press deposit to put that byte into memory there. One nuance to be prepared for is that when we press deposit next, it advances the address bus by one byte before storing the value. That means we only enter the base address, which is zero, at one time. After that, we'll just be hitting deposit next, setting the switches to the value of the next byte we want to store and repeating until we've entered all of the bytes. That'll make more sense once you've seen it in person, so let's head on over to the MSI. Now to access or get to any address on the MSI, we simply enter that address in binary and press examine. The current value of the address bus is not the switches, but rather whatever the address bus lights say. But when I set a value like address 3 and then press examine, you'll see the address bus jumps to 3, and this is the value that's currently stored at 3. Now let's enter something. Let's go to address 0, and we're going to put 0 by leaving all of these down. So now we're examining the contents of address 0. When I press deposit, it's going to take these 8 bits and deposit them in the current memory location. So when I do that, these bits should clear. And they do. And if I set the bottom 4 bits on, and I pressed deposit, you'll see the bottom 4 bits are now on. So to enter my program, all I'm going to have to do is set the toggles, starting at address 0, press deposit, and then, for each subsequent one, deposit next, because that pre-increments the counter of what address you're pointing at, and it will store each of the bytes that I give it in memory. Let's start with the first byte. 0, 0. I'm going to say deposit at address 0. Next. I'm going to move on to the next byte, but before I do anything else, I'm going to key in that byte, which is all zeros but a one, and I'll say deposit next. Then move on. And that should be all 20 bytes deposited. Now, if I set my address bits back to zeros as they are, and I press examine, I should see the bit pattern here. I'm going to step through them really quickly to check my work. Looks right to me so far. So going back to address zero, I'll press examine. And if I hit run, my program should execute. You can see the LED pattern stepping across the programmed output, which is the value we set when we do an out FF. And so it's displaying the contents of the accumulator, rotating it left, and then pausing it for a little bit so we actually get a delay and can see the step visually. I hope you enjoyed our tour of those mysterious front panels, and I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me out here in the shop today. I really enjoy making these more narrowly focused videos on older tech, so if you enjoyed it, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel. 
Both help a great deal with the algorithm, and especially when I see it in response to these types of episodes. Now, if you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.